Um, we're in uh, John chapter 5 today, verses 1 through 9. Uh, feel free to look it up on your phone, as long as you promise you will not check Facebook until the end of the sermon. Thank you. <laughs> After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew, Bezetha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. Who is the man who said this to you? Take it up and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. And later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin, so that nothing worse happens to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore the Jews started persecuting Jesus, because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. And for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> I read farther than was in the bulletin. <laughs> so... Uh, my name is Bess Perrier. I am the ministry specialist at Seashore United Methodist Assembly, which means I do camping and retreat ministry and community programs. So um, I have a really fun job. <laughs> and I'm really uh, glad to be back with y'all. I've attended here in the past. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances, though, but I am glad to see you again. Um, as for my personal life, um, I became a Christian when I was 18. I was an atheist from the sixth grade until then. I was a weird kid, and um, I told God, I'll follow you anywhere as long as I don't have to be a pastor and I don't have to marry one. So naturally, I became a pastor, and then I married one. And we have three kids. We have a five-year-old, and we have, two, uh, we, we have a set of twins, boy, girl. And our son, Inslee, is on the autism spectrum. And if you know anything about autistic children, they uh, tend to fascinate over things. Even if they're high functioning, they'll get stuck on something and they'll obsess over it for a few hours or maybe a few weeks, or maybe even a year. And so when he was younger, I remember one time I was teaching him the letter A. We were going to spend a whole week on A. And we were going to talk about Adam and Eve. We were going to talk about anatomy because the story of Adam's rib being used to make Eve. And I was like, oh, I'm such a smart mom. We're going to, like, this is going to be integrative learning. And he got so obsessed with Adam's rib. And, and so conflicted about whether or not he would be willing to give up his rib for a, you know, for a, a girl he liked. So one day I'm in the kitchen and I hear this ah from across the house. And you know, when you're a mom, there's this thing, it doesn't happen before you're a mom, but after you're a mom, anytime you hear a high pitched scream from a kid, you go, ha! Ah! like that, like in your heart stops for a minute. And so I ran to the other side of the house and there's Inslee sprawled out on the floor and he's grabbing his gut. And I was like, oh no, Inslee, tell me what's wrong. And you know, he's autistic. We have to be very careful teaching him to communicate appropriately. So he knows you have to describe your pain. Otherwise we can't help you. And it's like, Inslee, tell me what's wrong. Tell me what hurts. He goes, my tummy hurts. I think I'm gonna have a wife. <laughs> And that was the moment that I realized <clears throat> we have to be very careful how we teach scripture 
to people because everyone's in a different place and everyone has a different experience and a different perspective. And so as I take you through this passage today, please bear in mind, I bring my own experience to it. And I just trust the Holy Spirit to send out whatever truth y'all need to hear today. So we're in John chapter 5, and Jesus has done, uh, he has begun his public ministry, okay? So he's at the point now where he's headed to Jerusalem, but before he went there, he did three public miracles. Two of them are in John. You can find the other one in Mark and Luke. So the first miracle he does, he goes out to Cana, okay? Great place to start your public ministry. It's a bunch of nobodies from nowhere. It would be like running for president and instead of campaigning in Florida, you go to, you know, Mississippi. I mean, really, right? And so he goes to Mississippi and he's hanging out with those people, the rural people, the poor people, um, and, you know, everyday folk. And so he turns water into wine. And it's a very interesting story. We're not going to get into it today. But the interesting thing is not really the miracle itself, but the fact that the only people who saw it were his newly called disciples, who were fishermen, and the servants. Okay? The important people at the wedding, they just thought that the guests were bad guests and they saved the best wine for last. You know, they didn't know how to run a party. The real people in the back that Jesus was hanging out with, I don't even know why he was back there, but it was just the servants who saw it. His second miracle he does, he heals an official's son. And scholars believe that this official would have been a Gentile that worked in the palace. Jesus, no, you're doing this wrong. You're healing the enemy. Then the third miracle he does is he cures a man who is considered to be possessed. Now, I don't care if you believe in demons or not. He either had an incurable mental illness or he was possessed. Either way, we can't even cure that today. And he healed that man. Then, after spending time in those places, what the world would probably see as the foolish places, he goes to Jerusalem. <laughs> and he's at the temple. And it's a Sabbath. And it's a festival holiday. It'd be kind of like going to church on Easter. Everybody's there right? So he goes to church on Easter is pretty much the equivalent. That's the crowd level you're talking about. And the, you know, the people who come out for that time of year that you might not see at other times because there's a party going on. Now the temple itself was huge, right? It was kind of like a village in its own right. And you would have like all of these porticos and porches, you know, you have like Solomon's porch and then you go in and there's the little place where the God fearers can hang out, like the people who aren't really Jewish, but they're nice to Jews and they like this whole one God thing. So they're there. Then there's women, then there's men, then there's priests and Levites. And the further in you get, the more important and privileged you are. So where does Jesus go? He could get pretty far in. He goes around to the porticos where the lame and the paralyzed and the sick people are, the people you want to avoid because if you get too close to them, you become unclean too, and then you can't go in and take your prospective place. You have to go through a ritual to be cleansed, or if it's bad enough, you just, you're out of luck. So the porticos, was, it was a place of, it was just a shaded place, and there was a pool there called um, the Sheepskate Pool. And what would happen is, is the pool was connected likely to an underground mineral stream. And so as the timetable or the water table, excuse me, would rise and fall through the year, the pool would flood. And at certain times of year, the sick people would flock to this pool because it was believed if you could get in it, when they stirred up the pool, you could be healed. So the people who were really important in the temple would send out an official not somebody important, somebody that they were willing to sacrifice and put into that dirty area with all those sick people, right? Because that person would become unclean and they'd have to do a ritual cleansing to get back in again. So a priest would never do that, right? It's the same reason why the priest wouldn't rescue the man who was dying on the side of the road in the Good Samaritan story, because they had to get to church. And if they helped that man, then they were unclean and they wouldn't even be able to get in, right? So they send him out and every year he would stir up the pool and that's when you would get in, and they would actually throw entrails into it. And it was believed that if you got into something that had the blood and guts of an animal that had been healthy, that their life essence, that you could absorb it, and it would regenerate your own. So these people were really, really desperate to be healed. 
And here comes Jesus. And he doesn't walk past them. He doesn't avoid that side of the temple. He doesn't look at them. He sees a man who's been there for 38 years. And he sees him as a person. Martin Luther King Jr. did a sermon during the peak of the civil rights era that I think is very poignant for us today because I think we're experiencing a lot of the same things that they were then, a lot of open public division and violence and rhetoric. And he talked about how there's two types of Christianity during these times. There's if Christianity and there's though Christianity. So if Christianity says, if I have time, if I can do it without the wrong people or the, the right people seeing me do it. If I have enough money, then I can help this person today. If it's safe for me, then I can help you. If it won't cause me to sacrifice anything, then I can follow Christ today. And then there's the though religion that says, though I am tired, though I am poor, Though I have my own stress, I'm going to help this person today. Because the, the though Christian says, what's going to happen to that person if I don't help them today? And so Jesus makes a choice in that moment. And he goes to the man and he says, hey, do you want to be healed? Which is kind of a funny question. Because can you imagine you've been trying, you've been coming for 38 years because people know who you are and they know, man, that guy's been here forever. Obviously, that pool thing ain't working for him. He must be a big sinner, you know? And uh, <laughs> he's just like, do you want to be healed? Like, no, I'm just sitting here because it's fun, right? <laughs> and so Jesus says, look, just stand up, pick up your mat, and walk right? Because nobody was helping this man. No one would help. Even other sick people were like, dude, get out of the way, right? And so he tells him, take up your mat and walk. Now, Jesus just broke a bunch of Mosaic law. He, he healed on the Sabbath. He got somebody else to break Sabbath laws. You're not supposed to pick up your mat. You're not supposed to do work. You're not supposed to feed your donkey, okay? Like, you just go to church and you go home and you eat cold fried chicken, right? that was made the night before. Like, you don't do these things. And so what happened then that caused the, the big stir was after you had been healed or if you just survived a disease or, or whatever, you had to go present yourself to the priest in order to be brought back into the community. And if, if you weren't clean, you couldn't get a job. Your family probably wouldn't house you. You wouldn't get married. You had nothing. You had no community except your fellow sick and dying people around you. And obviously, as it says in this story, they were so desperate, everyone was just looking out for themselves, right? And so he goes into the temple, and what is the first thing that the priests say? They don't say, oh my gosh, it's been three, almost four decades, and you're healed. That is a miracle. What happened? They say, man, did you just pick up your mat on a Sunday? Right? Now, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand. I won't call anybody out. How many of you have ever been that person? Somebody's got something awesome, and you're like, bucket, cold ice, apply. Right? Because we get to a point in religion where we have to decide, do we care more about the religion, or do we care about what it's supposed to be pointing us towards? All, good religion evolves over time. Good traditions evolve over time. They never get stuck because they're constantly asking themselves, how do we point people towards God, right? Not how do we maintain our power and privilege for our particular group. And so the man says, well, the guy who healed me told me that I could pick up my mat, you know? It'd be kind of like, it reminds me of the story of uh, the people, there was a church in Jackson that was handing out food to the poor, and the policeman came up and said, hey man, you can't do that. And they're like, we're a church. What do you mean we can't do that? And they're like, it's against the law. You know, you can pray in public, but you can't do this. And the lady goes, well, this is how I pray, okay? You know, it reminds me of that kind of, you know, how are you gonna say that to somebody? So, 
they, they can't find Jesus. He disappears. Jesus always had an exit strategy. Like he was one of those people, you know, you meet those guys who are like, I never sit with my back to the door, you know, and you're like, whatever, man. Jesus really, he was like, there's an exit, there's an exit, there's an exit. He always knew how to get out because he always knew, you know, where, when, what the trouble that was going to be stirred up because of his healing. Um, and because he broke a lot of Mosaic law in the temple all the time. And so they can't find him. But later on, Jesus goes back and he finds the man that he healed. And he tells him what, you know, any rabbi would tell him, you're healed now, sin no more, go live your life. You know, same thing when they brought the woman who was adulterous to him. He said, look, sin no more, go on your way. You know, in other words, please try not to fall out of the community again as best as possible and good luck, man, you know? But the man was still in the temple when Jesus found him. Jesus literally brought that man back into full community. They didn't chase the man out of the temple. They wanted to chase Jesus out, right? And that right there is what the church's job is. We are supposed to be bringing, using religion, using our rhetoric, our ideology to bring people into the community of God, never to divide, never to conquer, but always to heal and redeem. And so, I just want to close with one of the reasons that they wanted to plot, were plotting to kill Jesus by the end of this passage and for the rest of his public ministry is because Jesus was making himself equal with God. And I think sometimes we forget that Jesus is equal with God. When you get into a struggle in our very polarized climate today, whether it's an inward moral struggle or literally an altercation with somebody else about politics or anything, the thing to remember whenever we start to use scripture <clears throat> to defend our views is that you have to make sure you're interpreting scripture in a way that it's meant to be interpreted and all scripture points to the Messiah. All scripture is meant to point to Jesus. And so when you interpret scripture, you need to be interpreting it in light of Jesus. You need to remember Jesus is equal with God. Jesus is God. God's not some abusive father who put his son on a cross. God put himself on a cross, right? They're equal. We say son of God because that's, that's good language. It is, you know. But really, Jesus is God. And when you interpret scripture, you interpret all scripture that came before and all scripture that came after through the lens of Christ. Let me put it this way. All scripture is good for instruction. All scripture is God-inspired. Not all scripture is equal. Don't kill me. Just listen. All scripture is good for instruction. All scripture is inspired by God. Not all scripture is equal. It must be interpreted through the Jesus event, because Jesus is the greatest revelation of God we have ever seen. If you want to know who is God, what is the character of God, what does God think about, what does God believe, what does God care about, who does God care about, you look at Jesus. You look at where he spent his time, who he protected, who he chastised, who he taught, right? Jesus even said, he said, if you know me, you will know the Father. I am the light. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we always take that as a salvific statement, like that's how you get to heaven. You have to have Jesus. And that may be true, but what he's saying there is you, you cannot even know who God is unless you go through me. You want to know who is God? Look at me. I'm telling you, this is who God is. It's why he forgave people from the cross instead of punished them, Right? Remember the character of God when you interpret scripture and remember the character of Christ who is God when you ask yourself, am I an if Christian or a though Christian? Thank you.